Good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening for some. Good morning, Eliana. Good morning, William. So good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for holding this. We're more than happy to do so. This is a space, a platform for our alumni, so it's very key. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to today's session. Um, we'll have a discussion about Lebanon. So while you're here, I'm going to briefly share my screen. And here, can you see the screen? Yes. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we're really happy to, to be here with you today. Uh, this is our second session of this week long of activities celebrating International Peace Day. Yesterday we started this session uh, discussing about female power. We also share a video that we did together with alumni from contributions from alumni of the CSP program uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, we hope that you can watch those, um, the remarks from yesterday and also the video that we shared in our social media and also the IFC USA page. Uh, but today, uh, what we will be discussing is um, about Lebanon. But before we kick off our conversation, we wanted to let you know that this um, talk, it's been um, recorded. So the recording is on. If you feel uncomfortable uh, with you being recorded, please turn off your camera. Uh, otherwise, if your internet permits, do keep your camera on so it's easier to, to get a very sense for our panelists of uh, the atmosphere in the room. Also, um, be ready to listen, keep your um, heart open. This is a very uh, sensitive conversation that we will have today. So we do uh, ask you to, to keep that in mind and, and to be ready to, to listen from our panelists who will share uh, more in detail about the current situation in Lebanon. Other points about what can you expect from today's session, uh, I'm gonna give a very brief introduction about what GAIN is, which is the Global Alumni Initiative that is hosting these activities. Then we will have an opening question that our uh, panelists asked that they would like to know from you. So we will be sharing a um, link via um, Mentimeter and via the chat. So you can type there uh, the response to this question that we're gonna ask and then we will give the floor to Vanessa, who is the moderator for today's session, and we will kick off our uh, dialogue. So without further ado, because we do have limited time and we want to respect everyone's schedules, I uh, will start with this brief introduction about GAIN. So GAIN is a program from IFC USA. It's the Global Alumni Initiative, and it is the program, sorry about that, uh, and it's the program that is bringing together the alumni from the co-scholars programs, the Community Trust Building Fellowship and the Narrative Change Collaborative. It's a thousand and plus alumni that have been part of these programs uh, for 20 years and running. And the goal of this program is to be a platform for our alumni. So we believe that our alumni are leaders in their own right that they are doing amazing work in different parts of the world. They are connected globally, but working locally. And that it's very important to provide a space where we can all connect and support each other. Uh, so for that reason, we have created this program that is uh, at this point online, and we do hope that it's gonna turn into uh, more activity in person. The main goal of the program is to support our alumni, to promote the work that they do in terms of promoting uh, equity and justice. We do it at different levels, personal level, relational level, systemic level, depending on where alumni are. And we're absolutely committed to, to human dignity, justice, social justice, and, and to transform the realities in, in the places where we are. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the program, you can text me or email us. Jitka is also part of it. Um, she's uh, the convener and the connector actually. So we wouldn't be able to have this program without her support. So I'm absolutely uh, grateful for her. Uh, but that's it about GAIN. And now we're gonna kick off with our conversation for today. 
So as you know, uh, today the conversation will be about Lebanon. And one of the questions, questions that our uh, panelists had was this one. Why are you interested in today's session? So I'm gonna now share here the Mentimeter. And Ditka, can you share via chat the link to the Menti? So that you can also, so, and I'm gonna try also to share it so you can go to the Mentimeter here. So this is the link. And this is the code. That you can use to answer this question. So if you can go into your chat and click on the link, it will take, take you to the website where you can answer the question. So you have two people there, but still can see the answers. So maybe there is an error the way you, I set it up this Mentimeter, so I can see that you are providing the answers, but I cannot see the, the responses. So give me a second, I'll stop sharing. And in the meantime, what we can do while you continue providing your input is uh, to introduce the speaker. So I'll give the floor to Vanessa and then we can start with that part and then we can go back to, to see your input from the questions. All right, thank you, Yitka. Um, thank you for organizing this and uh, for really like shedding the light on uh, Lebanon in this session. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, my uh, fellows uh, from CO. Um, I will start uh, by Maggie. Uh, Maggie, she's a co scholar uh, from 2011. She is a research coordinator at an INGO and worked previously um, as a research consultant with the Ministry of Public Health. Her main areas of interest are public health, mental health, refugees, and vulnerable communities. Uh, she has a background in so social psychology and international affairs. Um, Miriam Aziz, I'm not sure if she joined yet, but anyway, I can introduce her briefly. Uh, she has majored in political science and international affairs. Uh, she's co scholar from 2015, and she has a degree in conflict transformation at the Eastern Mennonite University as a Fulbright uh, scholar. Uh, she's currently working as a resettlement associate at the UNHCR. Uh, Hala uh, Flayhan, uh, a friend uh, and a colleague, she's a co-scholar from 2004 and four. Uh, she works at the Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service at the American University of Beirut. And she manages programs that promote education and psychological well-being, uh, psychosocial well-being. She holds a master's in international peace studies from the University of Notre Dame in the US and a bachelor's degree in psychology from the AUB, the American University of Beirut. Hamad Ghabris is from IOFC Lebanon. He works on the Syrian refugee crisis in Lebanon and also on the intersection between gender equality and the humanitarian development. He worked at INGOs in India mainly, Sri Lanka and Lebanon. He holds an MA in International Affairs and Diplomacy at the Notre Dame University in Lebanon. Wadia Khouri is also from uh, IOFC Lebanon. She's a lecturer and a researcher in Education Sciences at the Lebanese University and uh, St. Joseph University in Lebanon. She's also a senior coach and former member of the International Council of IOFC International. 
Uh, and myself, uh, I'm Vanessa Batil. Uh, I'm also a co-scholar uh, alumna from 2013. Um, I am the founder and the director of a, a Lebanon-based NGO called Media Association for Peace, MAP, that is dedicated to uh, train journalists and media activists uh, on the role of media and peace building through the model of uh, peace journalism. Um, I also consult for uh, international uh, NGOs uh, and UN agencies um, on media, conflict, uh, and the peace building. And I have an MA from the University for Peace, the UN University in Costa Rica, and the uh, BA in political science and uh, journalism. Uh, so this is like uh, briefly who we are. Uh, we're very happy to share with you our um, uh, maybe experience from the uh, Beirut uh, explosion and uh, on the professional and the personal level and a bit of what we're going through in Lebanon uh, now. Uh, just an overview, a quick overview for the ones maybe who uh, do not have a lot of details. I know that everyone knows about what happened in Lebanon, but just to uh, let you know that the blast happened almost a month and a half ago. Um, and it was due to um, a storage of the ammonium nitrate in uh, Beirut port. I mean, the, the ammonium was stored in, more than, in the port for more than six years. And it has led to an explosion, a sudden explosion. Um, and of course, I mean, there were more than 200 deaths and 3,100 uh, homeless people now. And uh, damage of uh, between 10 and 15 uh, billion US dollars. We're currently trying to reconstruct Beirut. The, um, maybe the good side is that this uh, incident has really uh, highlighted the solidarity among the citizens, among Lebanese citizens, and also the international support that we got and we're still getting to reconstruct the country. But I would like to highlight a very important point that it's not only about the explosion, but it's also about everything that we're already going through in Lebanon, starting from the revolution, um, the Lebanese people has took streets in October 2019 to demand a political change. And we also are going through another uh, crisis, which is an economic crisis. Our local currency um, is really uh, losing its value. It's like practically collapsing. And, and adding to it the pandemic, which is an international health crisis, but you know, since the hospitals, many of the Beirut hospitals were uh, damaged. I mean, they have also like a, a lot of uh, challenges to uh, host uh, more patients. So three or four crises at the same time, I think it's um, a bit too much for a small country like Lebanon to handle. And we as um, as social workers, uh, peace builders, like you name it, um, as you know, NGO managers or workers, we're trying as much as we can to make a change in these very difficult times. Uh, with the community that we work uh, in and uh, also uh, on the personal level with, uh, with the people that we know and um, uh, the ones that we know that they care about uh, making a difference and helping in Lebanon, like yourself. And we are um, very happy to see that um, uh, the Beirut blast has took a lot of uh, attention in a good way. Like we have really witnessed uh, a lot of solidarity uh, internationally. Like I personally have received more than 200 messages from uh, people and friends I know abroad. And really, this has really helped in these difficult times to see that uh, people are really like uh, feeling what we're feeling and uh, are happy to help and to support us in this uh, very tough times. Um, like, I'm not going to say more. I was just going to leave the floor for uh, uh, my colleagues and my friends to uh, also share their own experience about um, this very difficult times on the personal and the professional levels. Each one of them, they are doing amazing work in their institutions. And uh, I'm very happy like, to let them talk about uh, the efforts that they are doing on the local level. I'm going to start with Maggie. Maggie, if you can let us know um, your own experience after the blast and also what you're doing uh, uh, in your organization. Um, yes, thank you, Vanessa. And thank you, Yitka and Eliana, for setting this up. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you for IFC and GAIN for the event today and series of events this week actually to talk about peace in very, very difficult times uh, globally, if I may say, and in Lebanon specifically. So on, um, on August 4th, uh, exactly eight minutes before the blast, I had just made um, a U-turn less than one kilometer away from the Beirut port and I was heading home uh, for the evening 
Uh, I was still in my car on the phone when the blast occurred. The person with me on the phone remembers the blasting sound of the, of the explosion, but I don't. Uh, she also in, remembers my incoherence for well over an hour after what happened. I had hit my hand and my head somehow somewhere in the car, but only became aware of the pain a few hours later. In the meantime, actually, I was frantically searching for my friend. Uh, a few days later, my other friends told me that they actually reassured me that she's doing okay in a hospital only two hours after the blast. But my, my memory of things is, is very different. Uh, I remember being worried for hours and hours, um, trying to search for her and thinking that something bad had happened. I guess time had stopped somehow uh, there. And, uh, and then time stood still for a couple of weeks after that. Uh, I took two weeks off of work and the only thing I was doing was switching from news channel to the other, refreshing my Twitter feed and checking Instagram stories to see more about uh, the blast. And everyone was talking about Beirut, everyone was talking about Lebanon. But um, that died down somehow, as all breaking news do. So this conversation today about Beirut, about what's happening, is so, so important. And I can't stress enough uh, my gratitude for Yitka and the IOPC family. So uh, on August 5th, the next morning, I had already organized a humble fundraising in my hometown. Uh, where I had escaped to after what happened, uh, young men and women jumped to the opportunity to send food and basic needs to Beirut. And it was all uh, very, very spontaneous. Um, and War Child Holland, the international NGO where I work, uh, also regrouped on the second day. Staff were on the streets of Beirut the day after. Uh, and this was all the, the, the cleanup phase. Um, a few days later, the organization started conducting uh, emergency psychological first aid to families, men, women, and children who were um, directly affected uh, by the blast. So almost everyone I know was affected and everyone I know is doing or trying to do something, even the tiniest of things to help someone else in need. So, all of this, however, is not, is not the complete picture. I want you to just imagine that in your country, uh, you woke up one day to find that all of your life savings are now worth eight, what they originally were worth. So that is one over eight. And this means your purchasing power decreased significantly. And there is occupation, there are foreign sanctions, closed borders, a garbage crisis, a raging pandemic, and, and then your port blows up and threatening your exports, imports, lifeline. So to add salt to injury, uh, there is a corrupt political class and a complete institutionalized incompetence in managing in any shape or form any of these internal crises. So I want you to also imagine, for example, post 9-11, Young people in New York put their masks on, gloved up, carried brooms and shovels, and went to pick, uh, to pick up the rebels. Um, not the New York Fire Department, or the police, or other governmental agencies who should be responsible for this. No, but it's just the young men and women. And while these young men and women were doing that, there were military ships docking on your now non-existing port for the fun geopolitical game to start. So to loop back in on the topic of today, um, there are many, many personal initiatives. There are civil society actors working on the ground. This is all good, this is all happening. But the conversation about Lebanon that we wish we have um, should continue here in Lebanon. Uh, this is not breaking news for us. And then it dies down. This is the lives of 4 million people and more. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know, and Vanessa 
briefly mentioned, there was an exceptional chance for Lebanon to be the kind of country its citizens wished it could be. And that was almost one year ago in October 2019, when people took to the streets to change the system. And why do I say the system? It's because here in Lebanon, we don't stand against a monarch or a king or a dictator. We stand against a system uh, that just celebrated its 100th anniversary um, that has been systematically driving Lebanese people abroad to search a better life or uh, uh, tearing apart Lebanese who are staying here uh, to fight, uh, tearing them apart on the basis of uh, religion and sect and many other things. So unless these 4 million uh, people, these 4 million Lebanese and many, many more abroad give up, at least we all give up, uh, we must continue to eradicate the system. Um, so I thank you all for your time and I wish uh, that all of us would pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Um, just as uh, Eliana mentioned, if you have any question to the speaker while they are speaking, you can just uh, write uh, down your question and we can uh, uh, ask it uh, to the person right after it. In all cases, we're going to have at the end like a 15 minutes uh, to have an open discussion and to, um, uh, to listen to your questions directly. Um, I will move now to, um, I think, to Hala. Uh, since I'm not seeing Maggie, I mean, not, uh, not Maggie Miriam. Okay, uh, Hala, um, if you can please uh, share your own experience and uh, let, us, right. let us know your ideas and insights. Thank you so much for, for, for this space to share our stories and um, update whoever is interested. And um, I see some of my friends and family from around the world. So thank you for also being here and listening to our stories. Um, so I will share, uh, as Maggie did, where I was on August 4th. On that specific day, um, I decided to take off work and spend the time with my family in Ashrafi in their home, so at my parents' house. Um, and just moments before the blast, my daughter and I, who is almost two years old, were on the balcony um, and she was playing just like any child would do. Um, and then the doorbell rang, fortunately. So her curiosity led her back inside to the house. And of course I followed her. And then I let her continue her curiosity with the person who came and left her with my mom and my family in the living room. And I went into another room. And then I find myself, the ground is shaking. We don't know what, I didn't know what happened. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm holding on to a dresser um, in my parents' room. As I see the glass shattering the window, the glass of the window in my parents' room shattering and falling on my, on my dad while he was taking a nap. At that moment, I just completely let go. Um, I had no feelings. Uh, it was just like a white space. And it was just a matter of seconds but I knew, I knew that my dad was alive. I didn't know how, how alive he was, but I knew he was alive. And then my next thoughts were, I need to go see where my daughter is. And in that moment, I was like, I'm sure I'm gonna find her in pieces because the explosion, the sound, I mean, whoever heard it, whoever experienced it, thought it was right outside their door. And I think that's true for, for, for my colleagues here on the panel. Um, so I, I rushed into the living room and I, I, saw, I saw my family where everyone was running around uh, screaming. And the first thing I said was, where's Nye? And we all were like, we all look, where's Nye? And then we, we saw her on the ground, covered in blood. My brother gave her to me. And of course, as a mom, you have to be, you know, she looks at you. 
for the safety, for security, for comfort, for reassurance. And, and so that's what I, that's, that was my reaction. And of course the house is completely damaged and destroyed. And, and in that moment, we're all just, everyone's trying to kind of figure out, you know, calling friends, calling family. And in the moment we're all checking in to see, you know, what are the minimum, thank God no one was majorly injured in, in my home. We were really, really blessed to have very minor cuts and bruises. Um, and so that was what happened on August 4th in, in my own home. Um, and I can't even begin to tell you the sounds and, and, and you know, the, just the, the, the sound, the smell and everything that Beirut had experienced in those couple of hours. So um, what I wanna get to next is, I think as Maggie said, it's just young men and women in the next hours came together to put a plan, to be on the streets, to help people they knew, people they didn't know. And um, the center at AUB where I work did exactly just that. So my colleagues came together and put a plan that night and managed by, by midnight to gather hundreds. They, um, we called for volunteers, we sent an announcement and managed to gather hundreds of volunteers students and staff and faculty and alumni and, and, and people even outside AUB came together and the next morning people were out on the streets clearing debris, rubble, helping families, um, closing windows, you know, just doing anything that they could to ensure that people could still stay in their homes. Um, so AUB, we have now launched the Beirut Recovery Project as a Center for Civic Engagement and are currently, um, for, the, for, those th for the next three weeks after August 4, uh, we had hundreds of volunteers um, out, in, you know, in, out in the families. We worked in three locations, which were, were mostly affected, in Madam Khayyar Jaitawi and, and Karantina, and uh, continued, doing, continued doing the work just to, like I said, making sure people, the families could stay in their homes. Um, now, our main focus is we have, we're now focusing on three main components um, and ensuring to have like high impact and quick response um, in, these most, in these most needed areas. So the first one is uh, we're doing home rehabilitation work. So we're, we're involving the AUB community and this is like, like I said, AUB faculty, staff, alumni, um, and, and, and and even um, anyone who, who, who can be part of these works and rehabilitating and re rehabilitating homes, um, be it taking a paintbrush, helping you know, families paint their, paint, paint, painting the walls, um, clear, um, closing windows with plastic sheets. Uh, another project is we are looking to preserve and restore because as you know, Beirut is, is, is also very well known for its architectural heritage and the beauty of it. And a lot, there was over um, 600, 600 architectural buildings that were completely destroyed. And so we're, our, our aim is to also um, uh, identify skilled craftsmen and um, equip labor, labor workers with these skills to be able to preserve and restore these architectural heritage homes um, and, 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 and preserve the identity of Beirut. For any of you who have, have been here and know what I'm talking about. Uh, the third component we are also focusing on is the psychosocial component. Uh, and what we're looking to do is more like an expressive arts support program for children and adolescents who are experiencing trauma post August 4. And there's a lot of symptoms like a post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. Uh, I think that we're all kind of dealing with and still dealing with. And um, it becomes kind of the, the images and the sounds and you know the um, re repetition of, of the scenario starts fading away with time, but the feelings are still there. So uh, I can only imagine what the children and, and, and adolescents and the youth are, are experiencing. And so we want to ensure that they have a safe space to be able to share their experiences um, and work through, working through the, tra the trauma. 
So it's a long journey ahead. Uh, we know it's, a, it's, it's also a long-term commitment and we are willing to do what we can to utilize the resources that we have available uh, in the AUB community to utilize our resources and leverage our expertise. And uh, of course, with full transparency, and um, we also have a donation link if anyone is interested to, to, to contribute any effort, um, any contribution makes uh, a, big, a big help, is a, is a big effort. So I can also include the donation link in the chat later on for whoever is interested. And so the, the, the donations would go to our projects and then that I have just mentioned. So I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Uh, we will um, follow up with everyone and include all the donations towards all of your projects at the end and also as a follow up email. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hala, for sharing your personal experience as a mother and also the work that you're doing at AUV. I'm going to give the floor now to uh, Miriam, who I think she just joined in. So. Um, Miriam Aziz, would you like to uh, share your story with, uh, with us and tell us also where you were during the Beirut lab? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry for joining in late. It was uh, quite difficult to, to join. Um, yes, uh, my name is Miriam Aziz. Um, I currently work with UNHCR in the uh, Zahle Sab office, the Lebanon operation. Um, to be quite frank with you, the initiative or the response that uh, I'm a part of had nothing to do with my job, although UNHCR did organize um, an emergency response initiative. But the initiative that I'm a part of has nothing to do with my job. It was about 10 of us, we do work together in the same office, but uh, we figured we wanted to skip all of the bureaucracy and get right to work. So the 10 of us initially put together an assessment tool using a, a, a program that we actually use at work. And so we put together that tool and we just, we went down to Karantina and Birch Hamoud, uh, one of the two impacted areas. And we just initially literally started touring houses to figure out what the need is. And, uh, and this assessment tool assessed basically their basic needs, so like food or anything else that they needed. It assessed material damages to the house and then psychosocial needs as well. Um, and we initially pulled together just basic, uh, basic funds from each of us, just as individuals. Then when we, when we were down there and we were touring the houses, we initially identified seven houses that were in need. And we all got together, we put our minds together and we decided that the most two pressing needs at the time were food and just closing down houses with basically like uh, glass and aluminum. And so then we pulled together more funds uh, honestly, it was all just like, you know, a grassroots initiative. So we started looking into each of our networks and telling people about this initiative that we were doing, that it was just individuals doing it. And we started receiving funds from people who knew us and who trusted the work. And then we immediately got to work. We, I personally coordinated with my sister, who's part of a, one of the scouts groups in Lebanon who were putting together food boxes, just non-perishables. So we started with that and we distributed these boxes to these families that we identified through this assessment tool. And then we started the work on the glass and the aluminum. And um, I'm very happy to say that we finished all seven houses. We closed down all of their um, windows and, uh, and doors. Um, and then we, we, were, we were down there in quarantina mostly and uh, we coordinated with Afr Jwa, for those of you who know Afr Jwa, Farah al -Ata in Arabic. And they, they've been taking on different houses, but their funds are also limited. So they started pointing us towards houses that they haven't been able to cover yet. And so we went into those houses as well. We identified four more because we still had funds. And so we took those on and we also closed down uh, windows and doors. 
So it was, like I said, just because it was, you know, very um, grassroots oriented, uh, we just kind of went down there and we just assessed on the ground what was needed and we just worked on it. And we, we closed down, we decided that the most pressing need was, like I said, those food boxes and the aluminum and uh, the glass. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to say that at least those houses that we assessed, we were able to cover and completely close down. Our funds are very limited. And as you know, you know, there's a lot of financial restrictions on Lebanon and prices are soaring. And so getting those funds wasn't easy and uh, our funds were limited. So we just, we did what we could with what we had basically. Um, and then there's also one more aspect to the work that we've been doing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Chance Association. They're, um, they're an association based in Ashrafiya, Beirut, and they, uh, they cover treatment for cancer patients, children cancer patients, and they were terribly impacted by the blast. The clinic was basically torn apart, but also um, their access to medication was, uh, was halted. And so we also, we had a little bit of funds left over and we're still kind of fundraising for Chance Association, not just, to, I think the work on the clinic is mostly done, but also to get more funds so they are able to cover medication for more cancer patients because uh, medication is more expensive at the moment and access to it has become much more complicated. And so, yeah, like I said, it's a grassroots initiative. Just a bunch of us wanted to do something um, with what we had and uh, skipping just all, all sort of bureaucratic processes that we would have had to go through. And that's, that's basically what we did. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for sharing the very important work that you're doing now. Um, I'm going to move to Mohammed. He also has a story to share. Um, thank you so much, Vanessa. And thank you, everyone, for giving us your time and, and your energy and attention. Um, and also thanks a lot for the fellows and my, my friends who were uh, sharing their experiences because in a way they summed up everything and they gave such an uh, excellent description of the whole situation and the dimensions of it. So there's uh, quite little that I can add, but, but I'll do my best. Um, from my side, I was in the mountainside, um, which is 18 kilometers away from Beirut. And when the explosion took place, the first thought that came to our minds after seeing the smoke coming out of Beirut was that it's definitely Israel. It must be an Israeli attack on Lebanon again uh, due to the political unrest that we were witnessing recently. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was my brother who was five minutes away from the explosion um, and all of the lines were completely uh, disconnected. Uh, we were trying to communicate and connect, etc. But because of the pressure of people trying to call and contact their beloved ones, uh, all of the lines uh, were, were jammed and there was no signal. So we lived uh, five minutes of terror that, 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 that lasted and felt like a, a whole day. Uh, and it was extremely draining. And on that day, I remember myself and my friends were heading out camping out in the mountainside. And we did, after making sure that everyone was okay, it was a blast due to the ammonium nitrate that we were talking about. Um, we went there and continued our day and went there for camping and just to realize that for two or three days uh, we were having this intense feeling of numbness and uh, as the days went by this numbness turned into depression uh, realizing uh, the cause of the blast and, and, and the lack of response and the negligence of the government and as my friends shared um, what the government the things that the government should have done were done by literally the youth of Lebanon and some other NGO and humanitarian actors uh, involved in the situation, which was extremely frustrating seeing the lack of empathy of the government and, and, and the extent of indulgence and corruption and, and self-profit and greed, etc. It was ex such, a, such a moment filled, filled up with fury uh, that that's, that's still echoing up, up to our present day. Um, Given the situation with the degrading economic situation, the devaluation of the Lebanese lira, people's savings, as Maggie mentioned, were, were gone into thin air. Um, the COVID cases after the explosion were severely increased from 70 to 80 cases per day to 
the 300 to 400 cases per, per day. And now just recently received 1,000 cases per day. So adding all of these layers of, of traumas and difficulties and, and issues was, was just draining for, for, for all the Lebanese population. Um, in addition, talking from my own uh, personal work experience, I'm involved with a uh, humanitarian organization uh, called Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, so the main beneficiaries that we uh, provide service to are the refugees. Uh, so it hit me when I got back to work and realized that our affected population and our beneficiaries are also the Lebanese population. Uh, so that was a, a, a reality check in a way. Uh, so the extent of involvement that we had was uh, minor rehabilitation, shelter rehabilitation, and the affected population and the affected area uh, of the explosion. Um, um, conducting all of these needs assessments and it was scary, the increasing needs of, of, of the population um, with lack of accessibility to food assistance, lack of accessibility um, uh, to a safe shelter for people to stay in. Um, and, uh, and as I've mentioned before, there was almost until now no presence of the Lebanese government uh, of, of any kind of support. Um, and um, again, seconding Maggie on what she has shared, uh, we were an open pray uh, for other international actors that had their own political agendas. Uh, so also adding that layer of uh, political pressure uh, that was uh, externally influenced, being externally influenced, hindering a lot of internal processes of development and recovery, uh, speedy recovery at least. Um, uh, the biggest need that has been growing, I mean, you might think it must be shelter or food assistance, but apparently the biggest need that has been present, uh, especially after the blast, was the need for a psychosocial support uh, for the people who were affected. So a lot of organizations and different actors are focusing on that aspect currently, um, you know, which, is, which is amazing. And a lot of uh, services are being available free of charge of, of, of trauma healing and, and, and psychiatric support and supervision. Uh, that's been said, just to summarize and, and, and add and on a note, uh, just today I received um, a text from a friend of mine over WhatsApp, uh, which was circulating, a post that was circulating on social media. Uh, so it's a snapshot of a newspaper that was published in Lebanon almost 78 years back. And the headlines of, on that newspaper are exactly the same headlines that are happening now. So the devaluation of the Lebanese lira, the call for abolishing the sectarian system and the government corruption. Uh, so do I see hope? Honestly, I genuinely don't see any hope or any advancement in any time soon. Uh, we're going down a, 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 a decreasing uh, slope of, of devastation. Uh, so therefore my only hope is praying for a miracle and some divine intervention uh, to change the situation. Because honestly, there isn't any single indicator that things are gonna be better, not even internally or externally. And currently, uh, one last statement is that I think we're currently surviving in Lebanon. We're not living, but we're just surviving uh, day by day. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I actually second uh, what you have said. Um, I also ask myself, like, I mean, am I still hopeful? I mean, I cannot really say this because um, I work for peace and uh, I have to, you know, keep the positive spirit. But, you know, like when you go through uh, times like this, you start to ask yourself like very deep uh, questions. And I don't know if it's um, our right maybe also sometimes to just uh, be a bit selfish and think about ourselves. It's very hard for the young generation of Lebanon today to uh, continue living in such circumstances. Um, and to um, struggle, like it's really, it's a question of struggling, it's a question of survival, as Muhammad said, and we're really struggling, uh, especially, I mean, us, like small NGOs, as uh, the NGO that I have, I mean, we're really trying as much as we can with the very minimal resources that we have to uh, still, you know, do the change that we believe in and that we dream about, but it's becoming more and more difficult, and we're trying to really uh, find new ways and um, to stay in Lebanon first, and to continue working for Lebanon second. Uh, yesterday I was uh, talking with the, um, with MAP group, the young journalist group that I mentioned at the beginning. And I was like, you know, checking on them. We do meetings like um, uh, regularly. And I was telling them like now after a month or so after the last like 
where do you see yourself? Like, how do you feel? Like, are you okay? Like, what are your plans? And like half of the group were, were telling me that they want to uh, leave Lebanon. Um, and this is the group that, you know, like we trained at MAP to stay in Lebanon and to work for Lebanon and to uh, practice peace journalism. And now they want to leave Lebanon. So, you know, it's all, it's really very challenging, like uh, how to take it from there. You know, should we stay? Should we keep uh, like fighting or should we maybe think about our individual interests and uh, build a future elsewhere in a place that would respect us more, that would value us more? So those are all the questions that we're really like thinking about now and we're really going through this internal talk and the internal uh, talk also on the organizational level. And like, I'm, like, if I really want to be very, very honest, like I really don't know what tomorrow is, um, is hiding for us. Like, I don't know if this country, you know, is going to keep giving to us what we are giving to her. Like, it's, um, it's like we feel like it's uh, love from one side, you know? Um, so, like, I don't know, uh, for us, like, for instance, um, uh, as peace journalists, we feel like, okay, let's, let's do something positive, even though, like, on the personal level, we're not really feeling positivity. But since we have this mission and since we're committed to it, let's uh, talk to the victims, uh, parents and families and try to document those stories and, and try to uh, have more international support uh, for them and, and for the country um, in general. So this is a project that we're currently elaborating um, to uh, feel like we keep serving and keep giving to our country without really expecting much uh, from Lebanon, but especially from our governments. But I mean, like, this is like an internal um, commitment, I would say, like, it's, it's a personal commitment, it's a professional commitment, and we're going to, you know, keep uh, working for that, keep working for the, for the dreams, keep working for the change. There's already an ongoing political uh, change or, um, I mean, as I said, as I mentioned, there's a revolution or, I mean, uprising and we want to, you know, keep it alive. And I think it starts with uh, every one of us. So, I mean, like, this is like just the few words that I wanted to, um, you know, end the talks with. And I'm very happy to uh, listen to your feedback and to answer any question that you have uh, to me or to any of the panelists. So in the last... Uh, 15 or 12 minutes that we have. If anyone would like to say anything or ask us anything, we're very happy to, to hear you. You can just raise your hand uh, with the option on Zoom and then you can take the floor. I will, I will give you the floor. Does anybody have any feedback? Any questions? You can also just put your name in the chat and we'll unmute you. I think we do have a question from Rob uh, on the chat. Okay. So Rob says, thanks to everyone for sharing these very powerful and moving experiences. What specific uh, contribution can IFC make in the current situation? What is the conversation that needs to take place? Anyone wants to respond? Maggie, you were shaking your head. <laughs> yes. Um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, briefly, like there are many layers, uh, many, many layers of, uh, let's say, conflict uh, in Lebanon uh, at, the, at the societal level at the political level, national, uh, regional, international, you name it. And uh, we really don't get bored with, uh, with what happens here. Um, as, as we were chatting earlier, there was just a, a bomb earlier. Um, a smaller scale, let's say, now we measure depending on uh, before and after August 4th. Um, I think that the, to answer your, your question, uh, uh, Rob, I think what Lebanon currently needs is um, like what's happening. It's for the past month, it's just like uh, 
financial uh, aid from different organizations or people or, or uh, coalitions that are uh, abroad and they are helping because it's really a devastating uh, situation and uh, we're left in and uh, with so little um, to assess the economic situation in Lebanon it would take hours and hours and still we would not be covering what's really happening. Um, but from what I, what I learned in Co, uh, beyond this, beyond the financial, which if it's possible can be secured is uh, really talking about going more to the to, to the people's level and just talking about like how do we envision Lebanon how do we envision peace uh, these sort of discussions are happening at um, very sporadically and very like not systematically and consistently here in Lebanon so mainly like each one of us here, each group has a view of what Lebanon is and where Lebanon should be and in which camp. But at the societal level, um, people's needs are people's needs. They are the same. They are um, this cross-sectionality across all Lebanese. We need to really talk about it. We need to highlight it. So I think bringing that experience from Co, this open discussion, the safe space would be um, very useful uh, here in Lebanon. Um, thank you, Maggie. I think there's a, another question from Tarini. Uh, she's asking, do you see a possibility of getting closer to the systemic change that you have been fighting for so many years for, using the global attention received by the blast? Is there a larger silver lining that can come from the devastation? Miriam? Yes, Yutko. <laughs> I see you. I mean, if I'm being completely honest, I, I'll speak about myself. I can't speak for others, but uh, I, don't, I don't think that I'm personally at a point where I can see any silver linings just yet. And um, systemic change would require us as citizens of this country to be actual stakeholders in the system. And uh, I, I don't see that we are. I feel like we have zero power, zero authority, even, even when it comes to like when we campaign for upcoming elections or like, I don't know, fight for what we believe in. I just, uh, it's, it's, it's tough for me and tough for a lot of other Lebanese people at this moment. Uh, pe people that I know, at least I'll speak about people that I know to think about any of this at the, at the, at the, for the time being. Hello, can you still hear me? Ah, okay. Um, but to, to answer um, one of the questions about like, what's the conversation that needs to take place and where to donate like actual tangible actions that we can do. I think it's a matter of reaching out to people that you know and you trust and asking them like, what are you specifically doing and donating specifically to those people that you know and that you trust. And if you like the work that they're doing, donating straight to them, because personally at this point, I just trust the people that I know personally, you know, like if I know a group of people who work in this specific place and I've seen and know the work that they're doing, I will go work for them or I will ask for donations to go to them. Because at this point, at least my trust with, with a lot of stakeholders in this country has been broken. And in, in terms of the conversation that needs to take place, I personally cannot get any further than a conversation about trauma for the time being, just trauma oriented conversations, because I mean, the minute there's smoke up in the air or the minute we hear about another blast or the minute there's a fire, we just, we just panic, we freak out. This is trauma, you know? And uh, as people who are frontliners who are working with this response, there's also the secondary trauma that we're taking in. And yes, we, we, you know, we went to action, straight to action, but this secondary trauma we're still carrying with us. And um, 
I don't know, that's just the first, you know, theme or conversation theme that comes to mind. I can't really think beyond that at this moment. Um, but yeah, I would honestly just encourage you all and invite you all to reach out to people that you know and trust and learn more about their work, the work that they're doing directly and donating straight to that because Lebanon received a lot of support and assistance and honestly, I don't know where it all went. I mean, to be even more specific, uh, there was this assistance and donation that I learned about that was supposed to cover doors in Carantino, right? Specifically to doors. And uh, I, I, I was there and I toured the houses and I was like, where are those doors, you know? All the families, what they report is, yes, there's people who came in, they assessed, you know, quote unquote assessed, and then they just disappeared. So question remains like where did all the assistance go so anyway <laughs> i think there's a lot of um ranting and rambling that i can go on because there's just a lot of grievances and um so yeah that's that's where i am at least um if i may add something uh, to what miriam has shared i mean even if us as people united and we have such an excellent system that can work efficiently and can guarantee democracy i mean we're still an occupied country even though we are declared as an independent state uh the influences of of, of the french mandate for instance or some other international actors it being us iran saudi arabia etc we are not in control or in charge of our major decisions uh, that are that that are going to to, to affect to affect or influence um, um, the political uh, path of the country. Um, so therefore, we we you know we stumble whenever we 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 are asked such such questions because I don't think change could occur anytime soon given these international actors. And uh, Lebanon is a space of a proxy war. I mean, settling international disputes. Um, that's how I perceive it. Um, hence the reflection of having 17 million originally Lebanese people living outside and only 6 million living inside. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, we have a few more minutes to go and I think we have um, maybe one question and um, I think a person also raised his hand. Ahmad Wadi, would you like to answer your question, uh, to ask your question directly? No. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really sorry hearing uh, the hard time uh, the Lebanese had. Uh, I'm uh, speaking from Afghanistan. I, uh, my question was that uh, here in Afghanistan, uh, everything is uh, uh, related to the donor. So if there is a donor project, young people come together and raise their voice. Uh, is this the case in, is, uh, in Lebanon as well? Uh, is there any platform for young people uh, on which they come together or is there any communication method that the Lebanese uh, youth are coming together and if they come together and raise their voice to whom uh, they should uh, uh, raise their voice I mean, from whom can they take the help as Muhammad told that uh, Lebanon is uh, an occupied uh, country of the proxy war so to whom you are going to reach your voice like here in Afghanistan uh, if the people raise their voice they are uh, they should take the help uh, of the USA but USA is one of the side of the conflict, of the Afghan conflict. So to whom the Lebanese can raise their voice. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ahmed. Does anyone want to answer his question? Um, Hala, would you like to say something about the role of youth? and? Uh, to whom they refer to in such uh, times, since you also work directly with them. Um, yes, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you so much for for raising that. So, 
I mean, I think just seeing the dynamism of, of, of the Lebanese people and especially the youth that took the streets, you know, just hours after the blast and even during the protest and any time there is this um, uh, an incident or a situation in Lebanon, um, yeah, uh, I think they are really the movers and shakers of the country. And it's it, right now, and, I, and I, I, I agree with Miriam, you know, right now it's like, we all feel so, um, I, I don't know if to say like loss of, loss of hope. Um, we want to stay in this country so badly, but you know, they're giving us all the reasons to push us out. Uh, but, and you know, when right after the blast, people were saying what well, the Lebanese are so resilient. We, we are, but we're tired, you know, and the youth are tired and we, we just want to live um live for a purpose and not but not surviving as muhammad said um so what aub is doing and you know when has created like the center for civic engagement where i work has created this um this platform or this uh hub for students especially to get involved directly with ngos like uh, we have a lot of students who have interned directly with vanessa's uh, ngo and you know and it's a way it's an outlet it's an opportunity for them to have their voices heard to know what their interests are to know what kind of skills that they have to be um to be the the agents of change that lebanon really needs uh and i really really from the deep depths of my heart hope that we continue to have this drive. Um, and I know that we are doing everything that we can to keep, um, uh, to keep this momentum going with the students. I mean, of course, COVID is not helping in any way, shape or form, I think all over the world. Um, but COVID didn't stop us from being on the ground a couple hours after the explosion. And uh, so, I, and I really can hope that this dynamism of the youth continues so we have a lot of work to, there's a lot of work to be done and uh every effort counts and everyone who's on this panel i know everyone's doing an amazing job in in what they have and um of course the financial resources will continue to to make things happen for for all of us you know for for the organizations that we work with i don't know vanessa if there's anything else you want to add or if i I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, you did actually. <laughs> um, there's one more question from Angela. Uh, she's asking uh, what role, if any, might the Western governments have in supporting Lebanon? Uh, she's in the US and also she reads uh, mixed reactions about uh, Macron's uh, presence uh, shortly after blast. Is there a place for political engagement at this point? Um, if I if I may answer it, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's always a place for for political engagement in Lebanon. I think that's what we are known for. As Mohammed was saying, uh, we are um, we are a country for to settle uh, Western Eastern scores. I think uh, mainly the youth uh, and the initiative that should be led from Lebanon should demand uh, Western countries and should demand Western friends to really push their governments not to settle scores in Lebanon. Um, it's a really small country. Uh, it's really devastated and uh, we cannot even uh, fathom like the, the amount of uh, helplessness uh, that's, uh, that's um, spreading here in the country. And I think what Western countries and Western people can, can uh, do is learn from previous experiences that sanctions, for one, are not effective. Sanctions mainly target um, the people. They don't target the governments. And they don't target governments uh, and, and systems as robust as Lebanon. I mean, why hasn't there been a Lebanese spring uh, if, if you want to ask yourself why, uh, why it never happened. There were protests, there were people in the streets for several years, not just last year, but it never happened because it's such a robust system. And the uh, sanctions from, from, from the West, from the US mainly, were not 
change that. Um, they will just uh, make uh, for more suffering for the people. And uh, Macron's visit, everyone's visit is suspicious in Lebanon. I think, I think some of the good things that happened after the October revolution in 2019 and uh, the Beirut blast is there's this slight awareness, which is if you want, uh, this is the only silver lining that I have is that uh, the slight awareness that no one really wishes the best for, for Lebanon except the Lebanese people and the Lebanese youth at this moment. Uh, we want to stay here and if we want to stay here, we need to realize this and work, uh, work, work on this, work on ourselves, talk to ourselves before we talk to Western, Eastern neighbors, anyone. We just talk to ourselves, talk to each other, I mean. Um, thank you, Maggie. Is there any other question or comment or feedback that you would like to give from the panelists or also from the audience? I just want to say one thing um, about political involvement and engagement. <laughs> I just think in general, people who live abroad don't really understand how much their foreign policies can impact a place like Lebanon. And I would just invite you all and invite your networks as well to just, I don't know, do your research about Lebanon and to just vote wisely <laughs> because <laughs> God knows we need you to because, um, you know, your country's foreign policy and, and by your, I mean, just the U.S. in general, but also France and just a whole bunch of other European nations and Eastern European nations to just, you know, do your research, <laughs> encourage your networks to do their research and to just vote wisely. Honestly, we just, um, we're suffocating here. And, uh, yeah, we could, we could use all the help we could get. Because like I said, we as citizens of this country, we have very little agency over our futures and fates. And that's a really sad life to be leading. What one of you, I can't remember who said it, but I, it totally resonated with me. We don't, we don't live in Lebanon, we just like survive on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? And we're not just talking about the blessed, you know, it's economic crisis, currency depreciation, just all sorts of things piling up and it's, it's a lot. I think it's a good note to end the session with, like, um, yeah, to vote wisely and uh, to also support uh, Lebanon uh, through its uh, community-based organization and not uh, through its government, since uh, we really do not trust our government after what happened, but also, I mean, this is like long years of mistrust. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending this session. Uh, thank you for hearing our stories and uh, engaging with us. It's very important for each one of us to um, have this kind of support. I would like to uh, thank especially uh, Yitka and Eliana um, for giving us the floor today to uh, make our voice heard um, and to also like feel that we're not alone, uh, surviving, struggling, suffocating, everything. And uh, I wish that uh, we will uh, have our hope again because we really want to stay in Lebanon and fight for Lebanon because this is our land and we do not really want to leave it for anyone else. Um, thank you very much and I will give the floor to Yitka or Eliana to end the session. Thank you. Thank you to, to all of you, Hala, Vanessa, Maggie, Mohammed, Miriam. Thank you very much to each one of you for being here, being present. We know uh, this is also emotionally draining, so we really thank you for taking the time to share uh, your stories with us, to raise awareness about what is happening. As a Colombian, I definitely feel you. So I really thank you for what you shared today. Um, thank you to all of you who also attended this session. I will share here briefly uh, my screen. Tomorrow we will continue the conversation uh, the conversation will be about uh, the lead lives matter. We continue touching uh, in, on different situations that are affecting different parts of the world. This is specifically violence uh, that has happened the last uh, months during the pandemic uh, to Dalits in India and Nepal. So we welcome you uh, in that session. 
Um, you can find the, the link to registration in the Google Doc, in our social media. Um, but yeah, I just want to, to thank every single one of you uh, for being part of this session today. And we will continue uh, keeping this space open to support all of you.